So an incredible important milestone here in Asia and something that has been around 10 years in the making. But interesting the timing of it as well, particularly as we see the US-China relationship decouple somewhat. What do you think the US makes of RCEP? Well, um, I think in many ways RCEP is a uh, shot across the bow for the United States regarding its viewpoint on how it wants to engage with Asia. You know, first was TPP, which the U.S. led and then decided not to join. And now we've got RCEP. So you have two substantial economic deals that could really shift um, supply chain focus um, to an intra-Asian uh, supply chain prominence, with uh, U.S. exporters being left out. Yeah, there is concern that uh, it could actually lessen the importance, perhaps, of the U.S. on a trade front. Does a Biden administration perhaps turn this around, though, and we see uh, the U.S. rejoining the TPP? Mm. You know, uh, uh, President-elect Biden has made very clear that his prime focus is going to be on uh, rejuvenating the domestic economy and bringing back jobs. I think the United States um, general population has become uh, even less, uh, how do I want to put this, uh, sort of much more focused on domestic issues and less aware of what's going on in the international arena. And I think that President Trump's um, strong kind of um, bash the other guy approach to international trade uh, makes it hard for a Biden administration to think about TPP early on. Claire, it's uh, Rich in Hong Kong. T tell me, uh, you know, we had a guest on earlier, Alicia Garcia Herrero, and she was saying that RCEP is a low-quality trade agreement in technical terms, going on to say that it entails limited trade liberalization. What's your view of the deal itself? Well, you know, it's, it, is, it is a kind of old-school deal, for sure, and it is not um, uh, sort of breaking new ground with, with regard to trade rules. But it actually does something that uh, a lot of uh, trade analysts talk about being very important, and that is it takes that spaghetti bowl of rules that apply across all those different bilateral FTAs and instead creates a, a singular set of rules, a streamlined, a kind of, you know, bullet train for, uh, for, for goods to travel across and around the region now. Uh, so from a practical perspective, it, it could be very, very helpful for businesses. From a geopolitical perspective, it's, of course, important uh, when you think about the fact it's the first agreement that uh, Japan has had with uh, China or Korea. It's uh, the first multilateral free trade agreement that China has had. And it obviously, you know, indicates again to the United States that, you um, the world is moving on. All of the U.S. trading partners in Asia are moving on to try to create more efficient, productive trade, and uh, the U.S. is not at the table right now. Uh, Claire, does uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I know you alluded to it already, does the TPP come back into play as of January the 20th and uh, the inauguration of a new president there in the U.S.? Well, I think um, the attitude to the outside world uh, takes a paradigm shift, so that I think a Biden administration, even with a very strong focus on combating the coronavirus pandemic and really bringing uh, the U.S. back to prosperity, uh, is going to be looking uh, across the globe to its allies and partners and to those who are important competitors, like China, to understand how the United States can prosper effectively. There's too many things going on in our globalized economy to think that the United States can actually uh, come back to a robust economic future without thinking about the international dimension. So I would say that it's probably more a kind of weather shift, if you will, an atmospheric shift, at least at the outset rather than uh, the Biden administration wanting to plunge into doing some kind of very big headliner international trade deal, per se. 
Claire, we know your focus is, is mainly from the US point of view, but I did want to get your thoughts, if we can, on just the fact that India hasn't signed this RCEP deal, but there is this clause in place that they can if they want to join at a later date. Is this symbolic as we start to see these big relationships occur with uh, big powerhouses outside of the US, the likes of China perhaps giving a bit of a hand here to India if they do want to join down the track? Well, I would say that the... Uh, the, all of the nations in that region of Asia are trying to encourage India to join. And obviously, India is such a huge economic powerhouse in and of itself that it would really enhance the, the scope and importance of uh, an RCEP if India were to join. But India's concerns relate to the fact that it's really afraid that China uh, will be flooding Indian markets with uh, very cheap goods, and that that will be hurting a number of the lower income uh, elements and 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 industries in India. So India is quite skeptical of uh, the desirability of joining, and I think India generally has um, evinced quite a skepticism towards joining these multilateral deals. So. I wouldn't hold my breath on India joining soon. Claire, also give us a sense of uh, a Biden administration. You know, we've talked, talked around it to some extent, but AK may not join TPP or uh, the uh, CP. Uh, TPP as well as it's uh, morphed into, and uh, looking at RCEP as well. Where will Asia be in the list of priorities as trade partners for a new administration? That's, um, that's going to be a complex question. I think the United States' sense of its economic future requires it to reach out to allies uh, both to help structure a sensible economic future with regard to technology, for example, and with regard to national security and economic security. So I think there is going to be outreach to uh, the, the, um, the partners, U.S. partners in Asia, for sure, to try to work out some of these issues. And some of them, of course, relate in a backhanded way to China. So if there is a concern from a national security perspective about Chinese infrastructure, Chinese technology, Chinese state-owned enterprises, a non-market economy that is driving lots of exports onto world markets and hurting market economies in other countries, then you know, there's a need for there to be a lot of work together to do two things. One, to constrain China, and two, to maybe build a safe space for economic growth among reliable trading partners.